When Castile became emperor and defended Catholicism from the Protestants, the Catholic world rejoiced at first, with the most powerful Christian nation ready to keep them safe. What they didn't expect, since of course no one expects it, was the Spanish Inquisition to go about annexing every single prince for themselves. It was thought that the Spanish would wipe out the heretics and leave the realms to themselves, but it turns out these heretics can't be trusted to govern themselves. We're heading into the age of absolutism, and Castile faces a world where they can do whatever they want. Europe has been conquered effectively, but there's still more cleanup to do. The Holy Roman Empire, although de facto gone, still exists. As well, the British Empire, although irrelevant, continues to take up trade power across South Africa and Malaysia. Then, of course, there are the Ottomans, the Commonwealth, and Sweden, or the last oppositions to complete global hegemony for the Spaniards. Being the age of absolutism, it's of course a time of war. And for that reason, Castile is starting off the 17th century with a bang. A war against Britain, and a war against what remains of the Holy Roman Empire have been declared. These wars are basically janitorial work. The war against Britain is mostly something to ignore, except perhaps off in the New World where the 13 colonies are actually kinda strong, but I'm sure all my subjects can handle it. Instead, the main event of this opening section is the big war with the Empire. I'm doing another massive world war with all of Europe, as Russia's gotten involved and I've called in the Commonwealth to help me. I'm doing the same strategy as before with the League War. I'm going to separate piece the various princes, which will massively increase my overextension. It's a little bit scary to go over 100% overextension, but I'm trying to gain some confidence as an EU4 player, so I'm taking on heavy overextension more often. It was when I took Bohemia that my overextension really crept into massive levels. I'm at 219% already, and we're not even done conquering. By the way, the Commonwealth became a Republic, which I'm not sure how that happened, but it's kind of cool. It does mean I can't turn them into a union, which I was considering doing eventually, but it's alright. Elective Polish monarchies are hard to put into unions anyway. I took more land from Volgast, putting me up to 260% overextension. I declared another war on Cologne, which hopefully will let me end the Empire. One thing which I underestimated in this run is exactly how many rebels I'd be generating with all this overextension, and that's going to come back to bite me in the near future. I pieced out Great Britain, taking South Africa and other little islands and sections of land across the ocean. While I was finishing up in Germany, the rebels were quickly multiplying, and I was hoping they'd take a bit longer to occupy most of my country, but one thing that really sucks about a vast empire like mine is how long it takes to drag an army around to take care of even small rebellions. In 1620, I actually, finally, for real, ended the empire, since there were so few princes left and all their capitals were occupied. In light of all the rebels appearing and the fact that the Commonwealth ended up joining Cologne against me due to my war with Saxony ending, I decided to peace out with them in a white peace. I destroyed the empire and I'll go and eradicate the minor German states later. With peace having arrived, I'm at 345% overextension. That's very scary. There are already rebels across the country and I'm going to do my best to take them down, but I honestly might have to let them take some land with just how many of them there are. One thing to keep in mind about rebels that separate from your country is that you keep all the cores on any territory that rebels take. That means even if a nation separates, I can probably just reconquer them pretty quickly. It's less of a big deal than you might think to lose nations to rebels. I'm trying my best to put them down, but all these forts and all these rebel armies with zero manpower to fight them, and I'm sweating. In 1624, the first breakaway nation got away. It was Provence, and it was indeed a big Provence on account of the cores I fed them earlier in their time as a nation. Quickly after, Naples broke free. After that, Gascony broke away. Again, I'm keeping all my cores, so these nations won't be hard to get back. Saluzzo took Piedmont away from me, and Florence grabbed up Tuscany. I lost control of Pesh to Hungary, but by 1626, things were finally calming down. I lost some land, and there was still some more to lose, but don't let that make you think Castile is a fallen empire. To step out of the RP for a second, I do have to admit that at first I was pretty upset about losing all this land, but after seeing it all happen, I realized it would be a kind of interesting situation you don't see often in the game. Most people don't let nations collapse, and although Castile is certainly far from collapse, this is a bit of a low period out of which I can rise like a phoenix. Switzerland broke free in central Germany, and a really big Morocco escaped my clutches. I finished all my cores by 1628, and all the rebels either obtained their demands or were put down. The first thing on the agenda now that Castile's horrific unrest has calmed down is of course to go about reconquering all the cores that were lost. I first went after Morocco and Provence using the Reconquest CB. The nice thing about Reconquest is that cores cost less war score to take when using the Reconquest CB. I attacked Naples right away as well. My worry was that they'd take on some allies before I could conquer them, so I jumped on all my breakaway states quickly. Being the cocky conqueror I tend to be, I used the war with Morocco to also conquer Tunis, who was allied to Morocco. I know, I just let my realm fall to overextension, but I'm confident Tunis won't be too much for my realm to handle. I took Tunis and reconquered Morocco relatively quickly, meaning Castile controlled the Maghreb completely by 1630. I took back Saluzzo and was working on it getting Naples and Florence back too. 
I annexed Provence in 1631, making my empire become a contiguous state once again. I finished the war with Naples, but they unfortunately require so much war score that I can't take the whole country. I've left Naples in the mountains of Avellino and the city of Lucca. Now I'm back at peace, but not for long, since Britain needs to go. Their new capital is some island off in the Pacific, which is pretty funny. I'd like to imagine the British government in exile is so anti-Irish they'd rather conduct government affairs from a remote island than just put the capital in Ireland. In 1637, I finally completed the conquest of Britain by simply vassalizing them. The reason I did that was because I had a meme in my mind in the near future I wanted to see if I could make work, which I'll explain once we get there. Next up, I declared war on Switzerland to allied Gascony. I'm going to co-belligerent them and conquer both of them in one war. As part of this war, I finally decided to conquer Rome. I was tired of the Pope existing in my empire, so I took Rome, which means I'm going to get basically no papal influence anymore, but I can still generate lots by doing conversions. That means I do still get to do Curia interactions. I'm going to reorganize my armies in Iberia now, since I've sort of neglected my composition. I took my entire army and parked them in Toledo, attrition be damned. I then made a template of 25 infantry, 5 cavalry, and 20 artillery. This will be a size 50 stack of units that fills most of the combat width for now, and it should be a powerful army that can beat most enemies since there's lots of artillery to pound away. The only problem is I'll take a lot of attrition in most provinces on account of the army size, but I could take some attrition given my manpower pool. In terms of where to go next, it's hard to say. I can go into Sweden, the Commonwealth, or the Ottomans. I'm thinking the Ottomans because I want to weaken them. In preparation for my war against the major powers of the game, I became the economic hegemon in 1647. I chose economic just because of how it can reduce minimum autonomy in territories, and I want to do a lot of tag switching. The connection between those things will become clear soon. As expected in 1650, manufacturers rose to prominence, and it spawned in Korea of all places. I could bird to get it to spawn on my land, but that's fine, there's no reason to bother since manufacturers will spread around really easily. I started doing a little cultural change towards English because I'm thinking of becoming England. The English mission tree has some pretty insane modifiers, whether you go Britain or Angevin. You might say that because Britain exists, I can't do British missions, but remember that England has access to all of Britain's tree even without forming Britain. A little bit of setup before tag switching is always wise, and to be honest, I've got a ton of diplomatic points that I really don't know how to spend, so why not? Before fighting the Ottomans, who I've now decided are my next target, I'm going to drill up my army in Iberia. I've reorganized the army, and they're preparing back home. I took expansion ideas only for the reduction in autonomy in territories that the final idea of it gives. I'm mostly brushing over the years here because there isn't much going on. This video is going to be pretty short because the Age of Absolutism is one of the shortest ages and in this particular playthrough I'm using it as preparation for the upcoming Age of Revolutions anyway. I'm building up courthouses and state houses everywhere to keep governing capacity down. I'm putting trade company investments everywhere, I'm just reinvesting all my money into making more money so I can defeat the Ottomans more easily. I haven't taken very many military ideas. I think instead of dragging out the preparation period though, I'm just going to skip right to the Ottoman War. As a summary of what I'm doing in this peace period, it's drilling, building stuff, and sending light ships to privateer in Constantinople to deprive the Ottomans of income. Let's declare the war now. The Ottomans are allied to Oirat and Adal, both of whom are not very relevant. I'm declaring a holy war so I can take as much land as I want, but holy wars do kinda suck since I'm likely to lose many battles against the Ottomans. I first went for a landing in Constantinople, but the enemies there were too numerous. That's already one lost battle, unfortunately. I instead took the land route through Libya into Egypt. This time I did win. I was able to break through Alexandria and Cairo pretty quickly and won a few big battles along the Nile, giving me huge war score. The Ottomans sent in some armies to Carpathia and Vienna, but I sent some of my reserve armies from Iberia over to handle them. With max drill, max army tradition, and strong generals, I am able to beat the Ottomans when I have double their unit count. I'm hoping I can put them into a doom spiral with this war, as they'll gain decadence from losing the war and from losing battles. Meanwhile, I kept sieging off in Syria, with Adal's armies acting as free war score whenever they went up to siege back the Nile Valley. I got through Damascus and kept moving north, while my Carpathian armies sieged down Constantinople. In terms of peace deal, I'm thinking of just grabbing all of Egypt. It'll look aesthetically pleasing, and it's some pretty valuable land. If I wanted to cripple the Ottomans, I'd run a snake through the middle of them, grabbing all the forts I could. I'm not really looking for that sort of disgusting border gore, though. Instead, I want to reclaim Egypt and the Holy Land. I took down Constantinople and Ankara, and all I needed now was a few more battles to get war score, and maybe some minor occupations to get enough to end the war. In 1675, I ended the war taking all of Egypt and Jerusalem. While it looks impressive, this land really isn't all that important to my country. My economy is already beyond any reproach, and this land won't contribute much, but I imagine it was at least a little painful for the Ottomans. I say that, but the Ottomans are in a similar position to me. They have so much land, so much manpower, and so much money that it'll take many wars to even begin denting them. Anyway, I'm back over 100% overextension again, so rebels are coming, but I'll live with it. 
I won't let any nations break free this time. By the way, last video, I mentioned that because my Mexican subject's capital wasn't in the Mexico region, I couldn't do the Vice Royalty of New Spain mission. It turns out that's not true. You can still do it even if the subject's capital is in Maya or Rio Grande. I remember in an older playthrough this being broken as I mentioned it was last video, but it seems that's been fixed now, so my bad for spreading misinformation. That wraps up the Ottoman War. I finished coring Egypt and Jerusalem, and now I'm back to normal. I'm thinking about where to conquer next, and I guess India is as good an option as any. I waited to build the Suez Canal to make it a little easier to do. I know I could have gone for India earlier if I had just not waited for the Suez, but man, it takes forever to ship troops around Africa. At this point, further conquest is mostly pointless. I'm going for Vijayanagar just because India is kind of a nice place to conquer. There are trade companies you can found there, and lots of monuments that I can't use. I'll save you the time and just say that the war wasn't all that eventful. The initial landing was a bit tough since Vijayanagar has quite a few troops, but their manpower eventually ran out and I was able to completely dominate them. At the same time, I went for another war against the Ottomans, but to be honest with you, my heart isn't in these wars. I'm feeling a bit burnt out fighting these mega wars against massive powers for basically no reason. Against Vijayanagar, I took a huge chunk of Coromandel and Sri Lanka, putting my overextension pretty high, and then I focused back on the Ottoman War. The war was going okay, but the Ottomans put up a huge fight, and they had what felt like unending manpower. I know I could win this war eventually. I have Constantinople, I'm getting more and more occupations, although I'm losing battles here and there. Thankfully this is an imperialism war, not a holy war, so all I need is the capital. Nonetheless, after a few years of war, I hit 1693, and I decided I was done grinding against the Ottomans for this run. I simply white pieced. I knew that by this point of the series, there's not really a guide aspect anymore, no one's coming in looking for a guide on how to play Castile in the 17th century, but what I want to focus on now is stuff like tag switching. I've been culture covering the lowlands to English culture so I can increase my share of English culture provinces, but I'm going to still have to do some unstating to make my culture share become mostly English. Okay, so we're finally at the big moment. I'm going to unstate a ton of land. One thing that sucks about unstating is that you lose your full cores in the land you unstate. But here's a consolation prize for you. I stacked all those modifiers that reduce autonomy in territories because one thing you can do is unstate land to change your culture share, then restate land and simply not core it. This is called half stating usually. The reduction to minimum autonomy in territories also applies to half states, and that means I can basically sit around without ever full coring anything ever again and only have something like 15% autonomy. This is minuscule in the grand scheme of things when my income is well over 1k and my army size is far too large for me to ever have the patience to manage. Unfortunately though, as I swapped over to English culture, I ran into a disappointing discovery. While Britain exists, you cannot form England. To explain what my plan was, I intended to vassalize Britain and then form England. That's already kinda cursed. I then was going to go through the Angevin mission tree and form the Angevin kingdom as England while having Great Britain as a vassal. This would, in a way, allow you to do both mission trees, one for the vassal, one for you. The only way to make it sort of happen now would be to integrate Britain, form England, release Britain again, and then form the Ajavan Kingdom. By doing that, it would be possible to have both, assuming that when you form England, it doesn't remove Britain's cores. At the end of the day, I came out of this run learning something new. You cannot form England while Britain exists, and this was indeed confirmed by the wiki, which although not always completely accurate, it is usually a good source. Well, if I can't form England, I always have other tags. I'm going to instead form Austria. I'm choosing them because they're not an endgame tag, uh, although I'm not sure how much the mission tree I can do given the lack of an HRE. I actually get a restoration of Union CB on Hungary, which is pretty funny. I could actually use it, but I'm pretty sure I'm better off just conquering them. After forming Austria, I just went for Germany. Germany's ideas are insane, and their mission tree has got some okay stuff in it. The big thing is the mission that gives permanent administrative efficiency. I got 75% administrative efficiency without even becoming revolutionary or anything, which is pretty nice. I can get even more once I get the government reform that gives maximum effective absolutism. In terms of getting more, I'm not sure if there are any other modifiers I can access now. I know Sardinia Piedmont's mission gives you a little bit, and indeed I should have formed them first, because now that I'm Germany, I can't form anyone else. I was a little bummed about England not being formable, so I wasn't thinking as much. I think Sardinia Piedmont gives another 5%, so you can get to 80% using this route. If you could think of another source of administrative efficiency, let me know in the comments. I'd be curious how high you can get. I think you can get to 85% using the government reform for higher absolute some impact too. With the tag switch, we come to a close on this section of Castile, now Germany's history, in the age of absolutism. In this age, Castile focused on its own internal affairs, only really seizing a little more land in Germany, killing off Britain, and going through some sweeping cultural changes that resulted in their orientation towards their German holdings. What I did for the last 20 years or so of this age was just build more buildings, build all the monuments I could, and focus on pumping up my administrative efficiency even more. I managed to cap it out around 82% using the government reform at the very end for a little more absolutism effect. With Sardinia Piedmont's mission, that could have been 87%. 
kind of absolutely insane. What I need from you now in the comments, dear viewers, is an idea of what to do for the last century and a quarter of the game. I am going to finish this campaign because I'm already almost there, so I might as well finish it off. What do you want to see? I've culture converted a lot of land, and it's nice and cheap thanks to all my modifiers. So maybe some kind of miniature one culture that encompasses just Europe or something? I don't know. I could try to change governments over to a theocracy and get my province war score costs down so low that I can full annex massive nations in one war. There are all sorts of options, and I have a couple ideas for how to send off this massive Castile guide. In the meantime, you can expect the next part for England to come soon, and a new series on an entire different nation in the near future. Also, CK3's Tours and Tournaments DLC is coming out in literally a day, so CK3 content will be back on the menu, and EU4 content may take a slight backseat to it. Sorry to the EU4 enjoyers in here, but ultimately, this is still wholeheartedly a CK3 channel. Without further ado, that's the video. Thank you for your time.